Iconic and brilliant writers of our time, Michael Chabon. Michael is the Pulitzer Prize winning author of The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay and the best selling novels The Mysteries of Pittsburgh, Wonder Boys, Summerland, The Final Solution, The Yiddish, Yiddish Policeman's Union, Gentlemen of the Road, and the children's book The Astonishing Secret of Awesome Man. Uh, also, we do have all of Michael's books here tonight, all of his back stock. Um, he has also written short story collections, screenplays, essay collections, and even a memoir, Manhood for Amateurs. Um, sorry, ladies, but Michael is already spoken for. He's a dedicated father of four children and husband to the wonderful author Ayelet Waldman. We are absolutely thrilled to have Michael here with us at Book Passage. Uh, for the paperback release of Telegraph Avenue, a story that is set right here in the Bay Area, revolving around the lives of Archie and Nat, longtime friends who run a used record store called Brokeland. Elaine Petricelli, owner of Book Passage, chose Telegraph Avenue as one of her favorite picks last year when it was released, calling it wild, wonderful, and thought-provoking. She also said that she wished she could write a review three pages long because there is so much to say about this intricate, magnificent saga. And I think on that praise, we will turn the stage over to Michael so that he can tell us more about his work as a writer and the fantastic story behind Telegraph Avenue. May we please give a warm welcome to author extraordinaire Michael Shavon. Jimi Hendrix. It's <laughs> yeah. pretty cool. Thanks for coming out. It's nice to see you all. And I always love coming to Book Passage. My, I don't tell them, you know, I said that Diesel Books in Oakland, I said this, but it's my favorite bookstore <laughs> in the Bay Area. Perhaps only because I've been coming here for so long, so many years now, even long before I, I moved to the Bay Area. So. Um, <clears throat> paperback of this book, Telegraph Avenue, just came out, and um, one of the things you can take the liberty to do, at least I feel I can take the liberty to do when you're doing a paperback tour, and I'm doing a very short one, is not read from the first 40 pages of the book, which is what you tend to do typically when, you're, when your book is new, and you're assuming almost no one has read it, and you don't want to spoil it, and that's also... You have to explain more when you go deeper into the book. Um, but I did a very long book tour last fall when this book was out in hardback, and I was really, really sick of the first <laughs> pages of this book. And um, so I'm going to try reading um, from parts in the middle, uh, taking the chance of possibly spoiling things a little bit, but I don't, it's probably, a, you know, it's probably a mark of the fact that this book is, there's something wrong with the book if I could read from the middle and not spoil something. But um, I don't think it's giving, it's not giving away any character deaths or <laughs> surprise revelations of parentage or anything like that. Um, I am obliged to explain a little bit just on the offense that there are people who haven't read the book yet. Um, one of the main characters, the one that we're going to be focused on tonight in these two short sections that I'm going to read, is, uh, is um, Gwen Shanks, and she is a nurse midwife in Berkeley, California. <coughs> She's married to Archie, Archie Stallings, and Archie is one of the co-owners of the record store Brooklyn, that is one of the main settings in the novel. And uh, Gwen, at this point in the book, has, Gwen is eight months pregnant, with Archie's child, it's going to be their first child together, and she um, has had a number of cascading causes that um, have led her to walk out of the house and walk out of her marriage, even though she's eight months pregnant. Um, she's had, she just had it with her husband Archie, and one of the things um, that has 
precipitated this decision is the surprise appearance early in the book of Archie's 14-year-old son um, that he never told her about, um, <laughs> that he knew about, sort of, but he has had nothing to do with this kid. This kid grew up in Texas, shows up in Oakland, um, appears in their lives, and, um, and that's the, the moment that Gwen meets Titus, Archie's son, that he's never acknowledged is really a triggering moment that gets her to pack her bags and leave. So she's left, but she doesn't have anywhere to go. Um, and so she decides to go to the, she, she throws herself on the mercy of her Kung Fu teacher. <laughs> and as a black belt in Kung Fu, has been working at, you know, studying Kung Fu for, for a very long time. She's very good at it. And she, um, the, the Kung Fu, teacher, the, the Sifu of the uh, dojo where she trains is named Mrs. Ju, Irene Ju, and she has a sort of secret room in the, in the dojo where she puts people up sometimes when they're in trouble, and it, she has put up everyone from um, uh, ex black exploitation film um, stars who are down on their luck to uh, 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 an actual living Buddha from Tibet who was being persecuted by the Chinese government and was in exile and, and slept in this secret room. And now Gwen is in this secret room when she wakes up. And that's where we're going to join her. A change of state. Molecules in transition, liquid to vapor. A Chinatown dollar store teacup flying a dragon kite of steam. No more sleep, said Irene Jew. The whoosh, the window shade, abandoned its post, and sunshine surged through the breach. Time to get up! Big day! Gwen opened her eyes. Dust motes drew paisleys across the dazzle, molecules in transition. And Gwen, just another molecule, a big, Fat molecule <laughs> tumbling random through space. Big day. <coughs> she ironized. Woo hoo. Her world now consisted of four walls and a lone window at the back of the dojo, secreted behind a knobless door that was in turn concealed behind a life size, full length still photograph. Slick pecs and abs. Flying, slippered right foot, teeth gritted in a predatory smile of the eponym and presiding spirit of the Bruce Lee Institute of Martial Arts. <laughs> Her life was a bedroll and a blue duffel, a meal in a paper bag, every day adding a sorry page to the history of her homelessness. The 36th week was fertile ground for self-pity in the crafted female, <laughs> and Gwen's thoughts upon waking struck her as neatly diagnostic. Mm. Master Jew cupped the teacup with its painted mountain landscape in her tiny hands, hands trained to mend and heal, as well as to deal blows by Lam Sai Wing, who had studied under the great doctor and writer of wrongs, Wong Fei Hung. She squatted beside the sleeping mat in her black cotton pants and shapeless white tunic, waiting out her latest hidden guest and source of irritation, until at last said individual hoisted herself halfway out of the bedroom. Gwen took the cup into the outside hands that had cut the tender skulls of a thousand babies, and whose lineage of instruction likewise could be traced directly back to the 19th century, to a midwife named Juneteenth Jackson of Tulsa, Oklahoma, Gwen's twice-great-grandmother. Hot tap water, Gwen said. She made a face. Her tone damned not only the idea of drinking <coughs> hot tap water, but all the eventualities that had led her to another lonely revelry in this glorified closet its sole ornament a Chinese dollar store Ming vase in which stood a plastic red Gerber daisy that was really a ballpoint pen. <laughs> <laughs> to this cut-rate futon with its smell like stale waffles. <laughs> to this moment at which a cup of hot tap water must, 
she would not have dared to refuse Master Ju be drunk. What I need is a cup of coffee. Coffee make your baby restless, Master Ju said. Make him want to run away from home one day. <laughs> Along with a cup of hot water, then Gwen must evidently accept an implicit criticism of her own flight from home and hearth. A 90-year-old Chinese master of Kung Fu, even a female one, was not likely to be all that progressive, you had to figure, when it came to the question of proper relations between husband and wife. Gwen drank I was amazed, as always, by how good hot tap water actually felt and tasted, how well it suited your throat and gullet going down, how drinking it seemed to loosen some inner string or melt an inner coldness you did not even know that you harbored. Master Ju claimed to be able to cure all kinds of ailments with nothing but a mugwort cigar and the regular consumption of moderately hot water. In the darkness of Gwen's belly, the son or daughter of her worthless husband gave a <laughs> flutter kick of gratitude. <laughs> How's your back? said Master Ju. Gwen reached the fingers of one hand to palpate the muscles at the small of her back. In the past few days, her pregnancy had been finding new, painful uses for the largest knots of muscle on her frame. She woke in the company of Charlie horses, grandma cramps, stiffness of the joints. She shrugged. It hurts. Master Drew knelt and reached behind Gwen to plunge her fingers into the root system of the lumbar like a gardener with a crocus to transplant. Mm -hmm. Gwen drew in a sharp breath at the pain, yet the abrupt, rough contact of the old woman's cool, dry, soft skin fingers came as a shock to her exiled heart. Gwen loved Master Ju the way one was supposed to love <coughs> his kung fu master, <coughs> furiously, like a child. Better, Master Ju said. A little, Gwen admitted. Here was the reason that Gwen had been drawn into and persevered with her studies at the Bruce Lee Institute for so long, training hard for nearly four years until she had earned her black belt, because Qi Gong, like Master Ju, didn't seem to care if you believed in it or not. She passed the empty cup back to the old woman who acknowledged without gesture or word the look of gratitude in Gwen's eyes. Master Ju also noted a thickening of the young woman's pretty features, a blurring of her wide gaze. Overnight, Gwen appeared to have moved into the climax of her term. The baby was going to arrive soon, and here was this woman with her life in disorder, working too hard, taking care of other mothers-to-be while neglecting her own health. To make matters worse, she had spent the past three nights sleeping in this tiny room in a hip pocket world that crackled with male energies. Master Ju hopped up a pill of phlegm and spat with feline delicacy into a linen handkerchief. No, it would not do. When Gwen had shown up for class on Monday night with a packed duffel bag in the back of her BMW convertible and traces of tears on her cheeks, long ingrained instincts had caused Master Ju to reach out and catch the falling. Now the teacher saw that she had not handled the matter properly. Irene Ju was a very old woman. She liked to boast, improbably, that she was the oldest Chinese woman west of the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> and over the long years of wandering in exile from Guangdong to Hong Kong to Los Angeles to Oakland, she had presented countless students with the black sash that was the mark of longest study of hardest training, pain, devotion, tedium, and work. Some of these students had been capable of magnificence and others of brilliance, and few had partaken of both qualities. Until now, however, none of them had ever been a pregnant black woman who drove a BMW. <laughs> <laughs> Master Drew never quite knew how to behave toward Gwen Shanks. This place very bad for you, she said. Bad smell. Also bad to look at. Ugly. Yes, 
going to make sound, a hoarse intake of breath that might have been the precursor to tears or one of her big sputtering guffaws. She massaged her face, took her hands away, opened her eyes. I mean, no, it's all right, but I'm sorry. She reached for the bed jacket in a metallic shade of good brown silk that lay folded by the futon and pulled it around her. She wore silk pajamas that matched the robe, piped with white. I just need a good night's sleep. Her duffel may open all the clothes and shoes and bottles of lotion encased in Ziploc bags. It was time to get up and get dressed for her big day. At 3 p.m., she and Naviva were due to go before a board charged with reviewing the status of their privileges. They got in trouble in the hospital. Gwen <laughs> looked at the clothes she had stuffed into her bag three nights ago the distended stretch tops and yoga pants, the preposterous bras and geriatric panties. <laughs> Just one night I could sleep. Need your pillow. I do, Quinn said, yearning for the long, cool expanse of the Garnet Hill body pillow <laughs> that for months interwoven with her legs, arms, and belly had been her truest lover. <laughs> I do need my pillow so bad. Go home, Master Drew said. Get it. I can't. Master Drew turned her back to Gwen. Across the scar and glossy bamboo floor of the studio, four high windows looked out onto the blue glazing of a summer Oakland sky crazed with telephone wires. <laughs> <laughs> Behind the concrete hulk of the old Golden State Market, a palm tree hiked its green slattern skirts. Okay, I know you need me out of here. I'm so grateful you let me stay this long. After today, I'll go to a hotel. I'll rent an apartment. One of those little places down in Emeryville by the movie theater. Ikea's right there. <laughs> Get a crib, some dishes, whatever I'm going to need. I know I've been kind of lying around here moping and feel sorry for myself. My back hurts, and I've been maybe in a little bit of shock. There are a lot of things I don't know. If I could take care of a baby on my own, I'm going to be able to keep doing the work I've been doing for the past 10 years. Master Duke kept her back to Gwen, who knew that her speech had been disrespectful and poorly judged in both its length and its tone. I'm sorry, Gwen concluded. Seriously, tomorrow, next day at the latest, I'm not here. The teacup, smaller than the first, red and gold with an intricate carpet pattern and a goldfish, was in Gwen's face before she realized that Master Drew had moved. A sudden accident of vision, like a blackout or a camera flash. And by the time she realized that the crazy old lady had actually tossed a teacup at her head, <laughs> Gwen's right palm was smarting and the intercepted cup lay cool against her fingers, where, at the base of her thumb, it gave up one last drop. Big day, get dressed, Mrs. G said. Then go get your pillow. Maybe I'll keep going, but it's not too bad. Let's see if she gets her pillow. Let's see what happens when she gets her <laughs> Gwen felt nervous about her footing, her status under her own roof. So she had in mind a kind of marital Grenada, a deployment of massive force in support of a modest, even risible objective. But when she drove past the sleeping house at 6.51 a.m., an hour with which her husband had never been intimately acquainted. <laughs> it looked so ordinary. Blue painted cedar shakes peeling, honeysuckle strangling the slap beds, empty tanks from the arrowhead bubbler ranged along the front porch. As she lost her stomach for a fight, she rolled right past the house and for an instant considered driving on. True enough, as she had told Master Drew, the body pillow did not just preserve her sleep. There were nights when she felt it was the only thing in this world that felt and understood her. True to its name, the body pillow had come to embody the unknown child inside her, mute and shapeless, but imbued with some distinct essence or presence of the baby to come. The body pillow 
was a doll that she nightly cuddled as, in weird pregnancy dreams, the baby was transformed to all manner of beasts and vegetables and stuff a whole lot freakier than a pillow. <laughs> At the same time, she knew it was only a $45 body pillow she had bought online. It could easily be replaced. Hell with that, she said aloud, and parked the car in front of the Luigi's house. I want my damn pillow. <laughs> she did not get out of the car. She did some chi breathing. She groped for the shimmery little bead at the center of herself. She tried to harness or at least to tidy up her chi. She had enough conflict to deal with today, she reminded herself, without adding the toll to the toll of stress measurable in rads to which she and the baby had been exposed. Still, her sense of outrage over all that Archie had done and failed to do as a husband, a father, and a man remained undiminished by her reluctance to confront him, and that outrage fixated on, swarmed like a cloud of bees around the sum of $45. She was not going to throw that money away. She had left behind many things of value in the house when she left Archie, and if she never got back any of those things, so be it. Let the body pillow serve to redeem the remainder of the life and possessions she had abandoned. She got out of the car. Only one course open to her, to come in not like a battalion of marines overwhelming some little isle of coconuts, but like special forces, surgical, stealthy, in and out. Gwen decided to try the back door first. She slipped without much clearance on either side of her along the broken snake hide of the brick walk that ran between the house and a hurricane fence, the fence woven with morning glory like some kind of barrel basket. She sneaked past the kitchen windows, past the garbage and recycling bins, through that whole shadowy side zone of the house, which she had entered rarely over the years, a dense and leaf-shadowed passage hospitable, or so she always imagined, to rats. That thought hurried her along. <laughs> the backyard looked worse than she remembered. Brick barbecue area, angel's trumpet tree hung with yellow wizard hats. Chain link fence obliterated from view in many places by green flows of ivy and jasmine and morning glory. Shaggy stand of pampas grass. The forlorn expanse of concrete that some previous occupant of the house through an excess of laziness or optimism had painted lawn green. It was a mangy, scraggly, jungly mess that must be lowering property values as far away as Claremont Avenue. <laughs> it was an embarrassment. But Gwen had been gone only a week. This ruin was the work of years, a faithful record of her untended life. She averted her gaze from the broken lattice work around the foundation of the house, the loose weather stripping that peeped like a gangbanger's drawers from the seams around the back door. <laughs> when she and Archie bought the house, it had been a semi-wreck, cheap but ill-used. They had prepared a list of the repairs and improvements they were going to make. This list was divided among the required, the optional, and the fantastic. <laughs> they put in new toilets and sinks using a book from the library. They redid the floors, rehung the windows, patched the roof. It was the first common project of their marriage, and looking back on that time, Gwen felt a twinge of loss and regret for their happiness. In time, they had crossed off all the things that were required, but when they reached the next phase, they opted against the optional. At some point, well before they arrived at the fantastic, they had lost track of the list. Gwen unlocked the back door and pushed, but the door, but the door pushed back. The chain was set. It was a formidable chain installed by the previous owner, and to Gwen's knowledge, neither she nor Archie had ever employed it. There was something unnerving about the vigor with which the chain resisted letting Gwen enter the house. It was as though Archie had changed the locks on her. Gwen was insulted. She was about to start pounding demanding an explanation, but she remembered her maternal resolve to stay calm. Mm -hmm. It occurred to her that Archie might feel less secure without her in the house, and the thought touched her. She shut the back door with a soft click and crept back around to the front door. <coughs> As she let herself in, 
she realized that a faint rolling hum she had taken coming up the porch steps for the vibration through the old fur floor of the refrigerator, or maybe the humidifier in the basement, maybe even some kind of distant cement mixer or the medevac helicopter landing on its pad over a children's hospital was in fact the entwined snoring <laughs> of two boys. Julie Jaffe, who's the son of her partner Viva, <clears throat> lay half extruded from Gwen's old sleeping bag, shirtless and shockingly pale, with little pink guinea pig nipples. <laughs> Titus, that's Archie's son, had been neatly interred beneath Archie's different stroke sleeping bag. <laughs> Only his weird, fingery toes in the upper half of his face visible. A glacier of DVD cases slid across the coffee table. Strutter, ghetto hitman, soul shaker, all those crazy crap-ass movies that Archie's father had spent the 70s cranking out or being cranked out by. <laughs> Peeking from under a styrofoam clamshell from which a couple of french fries poked like the feelers of a large and cautious insect was another disc on whose label she recognized the astonishing afro of Valletta Moore, mm. along with the barrel and silencer of the 357 she fondled in that iconic pose from the poster of Nefertiti. <laughs> Forty stories of endless brown leg with a pair of hijacked fuck me pumps for a ground floor, yellow satin hot pants, a jumpsuit for a pendant. <laughs> the room hung heavy with a thug of puberty microwave popcorn and something unidentifiable but horrible. <laughs> Julie, in his nocturnal wrestling with her sleeping bag, had crawled so far that she nearly stepped on him when she came into the room. The hollow of his hairless chest, the puzzled knot of his brows, the soft, straight hair pasted by night sweat across his bony forehead, all stirred deep memories of the nights when she used to watch him for a viva and that, singing her grandmother's grave lullabies. His innocence then struck her, as she recalled it now, as having also been her own, before Nat and Aviva fixed her up with Archie, before the long, gathering disappointment of her professional life. She preferred not to look at Titus snoring away under a goofy and tragic mantle blazoned with an image of Gary Coleman and Todd Bridges <laughs> in matching sweaters. <laughs> she felt sorry for him, but she did not want to feel sorry for him, and so she let him piss her off. <laughs> Meanwhile, the mystery smell it became clear to her pregnant nose. Plains the pall of carnage was the smell of old hamburger. <laughs> she made the mistake of looking more closely at the clamshell package on the table. A pink and beaded gray streak of fat dribbled like candle wax down the outside of it and sent a rocket of hot bile arcing from her belly to her mouth. She would have been willing to bet $45 that ninjas and green berets did not, generally speaking, incorporate vomiting into their operational procedures. <laughs> the humiliation of that would be too much to bear. Archie had spent, without complaint, a fair amount of time in the early days of her pregnancy handling her various ejecta. <laughs> the molecules of oxidized fat seemed to trail her like malodorous pixies as Gwen crept down the hall to the bedroom and opened the bedroom door. The blinds were drawn, but in the window behind Archie's auntie's old Marie Antoinette style dresser, the job had been poorly done so that they hung at an angle to the windowsill. In the daylight seeping under this hypotenuse, Gwen could see Archie heaped up on the bed, flat on his back. It was a round bed that Archie had brought to the marriage. He called it his secret agent bed. <laughs> and with his legs and arms spread in four directions, he reminded her of the naked man by Leonardo da Vinci, <laughs> squaring the circle, whatever it was. Only Archie was not naked. He had on a pair of cow basketball shorts. Her objective lay right alongside him, 
bent double, ignored or perhaps trying to wriggle away. <laughs> All the other more conventional pillows have been kicked or flung over the side of the bed and lay in dejected attitudes on the floor. <laughs> Typically, Archie slept flat on the mattress and employed a pillow only to cover his face when the room was too full of light. He was not going to miss the body pillow at all. The molecules drifting downwind from the burger joint packaging in the living room seemed at last to abandon their pursuit of Gwen. She could stand to breathe through her nose again. And what she smelled was her bedroom, her husband, her life, the clove and citrus redolence of his aftershave, a Christmassy smell, a smell she had fallen in love with early on. Now it struck her as a tonic, bracing and restorative, stealing her to reach for the pillow, careful, moving slow, <laughs> holding her breath. She grabbed two feather-filled fistfuls of pillow and began to peel it away from the mattress one patient millimeter at a time. <laughs> Archie rolled over onto his side and with a sharp intake of breath threw his legs around the body pillow. <laughs> he pressed his hips against it, took it in his arms, drew it close to him. <laughs> he embraced it, let his breath out, shuddering, sighed once, and began to snore. Gwen <laughs> froze, horrified, thrilled, pricked by a sense of betrayal, the whether by her husband or the body pillow, <laughs> she not have to be say. Don't get up yet, Archie said without opening his eyes, begging in his sleep. He took another long, appreciative sip of unconsciousness, weighing the flavor of it in his mouth, smacking his lips. Don't leave me. Gwen considered a number of possible rejoinders to this. <laughs> Among them, too late, motherfucker. <laughs> I'm sorry. I won't ever again. And you are talking to a pillow. <laughs> She let go of the $45 pillow without saying a word. She turned and slipped back out of the bedroom. As she looked up from easing the door shut and releasing the doorknob with practiced soundlessness, she saw Titus standing at the other end of the hall, watching her, not quite smirking, not quite looking confused. Those blue-green Luther Stalin's eyes rhymed with the unreadable force field shimmer that veiled the light eyes of black books. I just can't get my special pillow, Gwen said in a pathetic whisper. Titus nodded, then seemed to notice that she was not carrying anything. <laughs> I changed my mind. <laughs> she felt a pulse of tightening across her belly that she knew meant dehydration. The boy got out of her way as she moved past him into the kitchen. Standing behind her, he became, a, he became the only thing that prevented her from backing away in horror at what she discovered there. Oh my God, she said. The boy concurred with a mirthless snort. What did you do? He said you could grind coffee in the blender. <laughs> Who did? Julie. Did he also say you could shoot ragu out of a super soaker? Because that's what it looks like happening here. The boy shrugged. She soldiered in, holding her breath as if of walking into a recently vacated portable toilet, <laughs> and ran herself a glass of water from the sink. Now I see why you put the chain on the back door. <laughs> she drained off the whole 12 ounces in one greedy gap. It was for the protection of the others. <laughs> that was Julie too, Titus said. He gets scared. Again, there was not quite a smirk on his face. His expression held too much curiosity for that. I know he does, but it said. Something, some routine tenderness in her tone or aspect of her he had not considered made him train his curiosity apparatus on her. He measured her circumference and girth. You got a special pillow for that, he said, pointing at her abdomen. A body pillow. I hold it up when you're sleeping. Mm, I don't really sleep, Quinn said, but especially not without. So, and that kid in there, that's like my brother. 
would have thought about rinsing the lipstick from the rim of the water glass, but in the unlikely event that anyone noticed it <laughs> among the marinara pollocks <laughs> and the termite mounds of plates and pans, the print of her lipstick could serve as a calling card, a silver bullet, a bent joker. Or sister, she said. You didn't have no ultrasound? Any. We asked them not to tell us. You want a surprise. Archie does. She said, I don't like surprises. It came out sounding more pointed than she had intended, but not inappropriately so. Why don't you just find out and not tell him? I could do that, she said. What? Oh, you already did. Titus guessed. Am I right? Gwen took the chain off the back door. Half brother she told Titus before she went out into the rest of her day. And half, I don't know what. Thank you. So um, I'll be happy to answer some questions. Um, if anybody's got a question, I'll just, I could just drink that. <laughs> <laughs> for me, right? <laughs> I'm that thirsty. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Is, is there a way to describe where your ideas come from? Is there a way to describe <laughs> where my ideas come from? Because <laughs> every your your books are all very men. Are very what? Very imaginative. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, I really I, I, there, I when I answer the question, it sound, it's going to sound like I'm being flipped. I really do feel that this is the case. The ideas are the easy part. I mean, the ideas are that they're a dime a dozen. I mean, the, the world's lousy with ideas. You pick up a newspaper, you know, there's 25 ideas for novels in there. Um, I have to actually fight against ideas. Uh, I, I'm always on perpetual on um, my guard against ideas because when you're working on a novel, it takes two, three, four, five years, in my case. Um, I, write, I mean, I try to write as fast as I can, and it still seems like it's four or five years. <laughs> Every time, um, you start to get these other ideas mm. along the way, every day. And sometimes they seem like good ideas, mm. and, they, and they kind of sing to you in the siren <laughs> song. <laughs> you're like, um, <laughs> you know, like, the, like the Cobra in the Jungle Book. Uh, kind of trying to hypnotize you, and uh, you have to ignore them because because they they want you to stop doing your work, and, and it's and it's a lie, it's an illusion, you know. Because if you do, if you do drop what you're doing and go off, follow that idea, that idea is going to become the idea that you're sick of, sick of, and stuck with. And um, you know, I've learned that over the years. It used to be harder for me to fight them off, but um, the hard part is sticking with it. With one idea. That's the hard part. It's kind of like marriage in that way. <laughs> you know, it's, the hard, it's, it's hard to stay yeah. in the book, just like it's hard to be hard to stay in the marriage. I work at it every day and do all these other you know, things that are coming along trying to distract you. Um, that's what's hard. The idea is easy. Yes? Why do you call it the Yiddish Policeman's Union instead of the Jewish Policeman's Union? Well, why do I call it the Yiddish Policeman's Union? You're the I've been waiting for someone to ask me this question. <laughs> this is 2007. And you are the first person to ask me this question. Why do you call it the Yiddish Policeman's Union and not the Jewish Policeman's Union? Because uh, in English usage, the word Yiddish really only refers to the language and the culture associated with the language. Um, and is not used to describe a person. You would never say he or she is Yiddish, you would say he or she is Jewish. Um, the Jewish Policeman's Union didn't do it. <laughs> you know, it, didn't, it, didn't, it wasn't what I meant, you know, because if, if it was the Jewish Policeman's Union, you wouldn't know enough 
about the book from the title. I wanted you to know what you were getting yourself into just from the title alone. But also, the book is written, in my mind, I was writing it in Yiddish and simultaneously translating it into English as I went. So mm -hmm. to the best of my ability, I was trying to translate. And, and throughout the book, you'll find Yiddish expressions translated literally into English. You know, like someone will say, like, stop banging me a kettle about that, mm -hmm. which in Yiddish is hawking or chinik. But nobody in English says banging me a kettle. And even if you said it more grammatically, it still wouldn't be an English expression. And so I just decided to do the same thing with the title and sort of literally translated the Yiddish policeman's union because the word Yid and Yiddish in Yiddish and also in a lot of other languages does mean Jew and does mean Jewish. Um, so that when the characters in that book are all always calling each other Yids, um, you know, it's a, it would be a slur in English, but they're not speaking English. I'm, I'm translating it partially. And they're calling each other Yid because that's what you call people in Yiddish, and it just means a person. So the title is part of that. <laughs> yes, sir. And following up on your discussion about your ideas, Yale Doctor had this quote about writing a novel that it's like driving a car in the fog and you can mm -hmm. see two feet in front of your headlight, right. but the thing is you can make the entire journey that way. Right. Is that is that your experience or are you a are you a uh, an outline or a plot to know where you're going when you set out to do it, or are you, are you just following those headlights? Um, I love that. I love that saying of his. Um, can everyone hear it? That that El Doctor was well known for having said that writing a novel is like driving in the fog with, or in a dark night with your headlights on, and you can only see just as far ahead of you as the headlights will shine. And, and, but you can make the whole journey that way just with the light of what's right immediately ahead of you, um, which is essentially a metaphor for writing without necessarily knowing where the book's going or what's going to happen and not having an outline. Um, and I think it's a beautiful image. I think it's true, and it definitely describes the way that I write. What he leaves out of it is the whole thing about the part where you actually drive into the ditch. <laughs> 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 Or a haystack, <laughs> um, because your foot isn't good enough on the brake, and you didn't see it because it was, you know, you were coming up on this um, ditch, and you fell into it, um, and it hurt. Um, I mean, that happens. Not just you asked if that was Found City, which was in the second book, the book I tried to write. That was my second book that, that I abandoned. But no, it happens with every single book, every single time I hit, I, I drive it into a ditch. Um, you also can't see the road signs around you telling you that where you think, you know, that this way will take you this place and that way it will take you the other place and you get on one road and you end up with a book that's not at all the book you thought you were writing and it's not really the book you want to be writing and then you have to backtrack and go back and try to figure out where it went off track and if can you and a lot of times you end up having to throw away, I end up having to throw away and hundreds of pages. I, for the Yiddish Policeman's Union, I threw away an entire 600 page draft and started over again. Um, that's what happens when you drive in the dark in the fall. You know what I mean? It's like better to have GPS, but, um, you know, or somebody in the passenger seat saying, be careful! But, you know, you don't when you're writing. So for me, like, I wish I could, a GPS, I guess, would be, would be an outlet. Um, and the person sitting next to you is actually, I have that, I'm married to a writer, and I yell it um, just as she does when we are literally driving, um, we'll, 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 when she reads drafts of what I'm writing, we'll sh shout, watch where you're going. Um, <laughs> um, so I do rely, so that would be the, the reliable reader, I suppose, would be the backseat driver, and uh, the GPS would be the outline. I have a backseat driver, I can't work from out once because if I know where I'm going, I don't want to go there. So that's where the metaphor kind of falls down a little bit, I think, because I think actually knowing where you're going on a road doesn't really diminish your interest in 
in, in getting there. But when you're when I'm writing, if I know too much about what's happening, I, then I think, well, why bother to write it? I already figured it all out. Um, and uh, you know, writers talk about characters taking over and, and doing things that they that the writer didn't anticipate they would be doing. Um, and I don't. I mean, Vladimir and Nabokov disparaged that and said it was ridiculous. Um, but what, what I do feel happens is you just, over time, you get to know your characters better. And so, because just like you get to know people better over time, and, and, and you come to realize the things you thought might happen when you first started, that now that you know this character so well, she would never do that. Or she might do that, but she's much more likely to do something else. Um, and. Uh, that can happen to me if I have it all figured out in advance. Just like it would be, just like um, if somebody told you what your whole life was going to be from the moment of your first meeting, the person that you've been spending the rest of your life with, um, I, I think you might say, well, thanks, but um, you know, <laughs> I mean, I'm going to go get a drink. <laughs> yes. Um, you write so knowingly of so many areas and cultures, and I, I believe somewhere you really spoke of it, I've heard that you do a great deal of research. Mm -hmm. And so I was curious <clears throat> how long it takes after you imbibe the data mm -hmm. before it becomes part of your warp and move that it comes out in your characters and your stories. Um, I tend to. You know, I'll tend to start by doing general research in the areas I think I'm going to maybe need to know about, and maybe in some books that's not very many. Some books it's not really anything at all, um, and um, and that is helpful just for giving me a sense of place and possible storylines and the kind of people who might be part of my story that I'm trying to tell. Um, and then I research as I go along and as I need to. Um, and make constant great discoveries through that process as well. Um, but definitely, you know, as I'm getting to a part of a book where I can see I'm going to need to know, like how you would, um, um, how you would steal a zeppelin. Um, you know, I, uh, I have this, something like that happens in Tom Graf Avenue, I won't give it away and say, what happens, or who, who tries to steal a Zeppelin, but um, there is a Zeppelin in the Bay Area, and now is this company that, that Zeppelins are being manufactured once again, and there's one you could rent for bar mitzvahs. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of, you know, so I read about it online, and I looked, at, I looked at all these pictures of it, and I thought about actually going out for a ride on it, um, but it was kind of costly, $2,500 for an hour and a half or something like that, so I could you know, stand up in the sky and go, oh wow, I'm really high up, and there's like <laughs> noise, and I mean, I just, I was watching videos of it and thought, I'm not sure it's worth it, and my wife said, it's not worth it, and then <laughs> um, I had to write this scene, and I reached out to a friend um, uh, who I just knew would be um, the guy I would want to have with me if I was going to try to steal a Zeppelin, <laughs> um, which is uh, uh, Adam Savage from, from you know, Mythbusters. Um, I'm just like, who would know how to steal a Zeppelin? <laughs> Adam Savage. And he, as I suspected, he would just got right on it and be completely, <laughs> deeply absorbed in the problem. And he, like looked at the website with me, and he like, close up, looked at how things were pinned together, and, and he just kind of laid it all out there for me. And we had a long conversation, and he explained to me what would be involved in trying to do this. And, and then I just took all that fresh in my mind and made some notes, but mostly it was just a picture in my mind. I was like, OK, thank you, goodbye. And I hung up and just wrote it to try to get it all down. And that is often with, with sort of particular special kinds of knowledge, I will sort of hoover up as much as I possibly can and then just go. So like the Antarctic portion of Cavalier and Clay, I researched for two and a half days at the UC Santa Cruz uh, library because I was down there working. And um, 
read everything in the entire, like the whole Antarctic shelf in the Sea Santa Cruz Library. Just everything that was before World War II, after World War II, was irrelevant to me. Um, I didn't want to know what subsequent people knew. I only wanted to know as much as people knew before World War II. And um, and then I just went into this cabin I was renting and just like and just wrote that 50 page section in uh, maybe 14, 15 hours. Uh, just you know, it's all so fresh and like, so vivid for me. So, um, to answer your question. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank uh, you. you have had your hand up, yeah. Uh, I'm fascinated by your metaphor of driving me to a ditch. That's, oh, yes. Um, and I'd like to know if there were times in writing this novel that you drove me to a ditch, when it was, and how you got out of the ditch. Uh, yes, I mean, as I said, there, there, it happens with every book. And, um, <laughs> Because I don't know what I'm doing, because I don't know where I'm going, and because I, I get, I follow some plot line or incident or episode that seems interesting, and then it leads to something else. But that requires me to go back and fix something that was not there before, and so it might be several months' work to get 50 or 60 pages of this thing just right, and they get their point and just realize, well, that's. <laughs> the book's over now. Like if I if that happens, then there's no more story to tell, and that's not right because I'm. Not. Were there point were there points in telegraph? In this book, that, that, that many. But what what the most what what went most wrong with this book, among the many things that went wrong, <laughs> um, was that I it started its life actually as a script for a two-hour pilot um, for a TV series that I was trying to sell to the TNT network in 1999 when they first decided to try to go into the series television business. And uh, they didn't pick it up and it, it just languished for a while. And I, did, I just kept thinking about that world and the characters and the record store and the midwives and Berkeley and Oakland and, and living there. I had only lived there for about a year and a half when I first cooked this thing up. And then after years and years and years, I, I really felt like I knew the place well. And I had accumulated all kinds of locales and anecdotes and people and characters. And I, and I kept thinking, wow, if I had just done that series, I could use that. And um, finally decided to try to do it as a book myself without benefit of a cable network. And <laughs> I stupidly thought I could just take that two hour script, which did tell, you know, it's a pilot, so it couldn't tell like, a whole story because then there would be no series, but it told two complete arcs, one kind of big and one smaller one. And I thought, well, that's going to be enough for a novel. And I just need to basically go in there and novelize it, you know, just like. <laughs> Transformers Dark of the Moon, the novel. Um, just, you know, take those scenes that I wrote and just flesh them out with some description and and boom, I got a book. I'm gonna be done with this by like, you know, March. <laughs> February. And, and that was just so deeply wrong. Um, I, and it was a disaster. And it, and two it took me two to two and a half years of writing trying it that way to realize that that was, it was just totally wrong, that, that a pilot or a TV series is all about just creating possibilities for further storytelling down the line. And uh, a novel can't do that. A novel has to tell the whole story. Right? So I just, um, I started over just with, with, I didn't, wasn't as absolute and complete as it had been with Gibbs Police and Eugene. I didn't throw everything out, but I threw a lot out. and. Even what I kept had to be radically conceived and rewritten. And, 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 but this time I started, this is a novel. I'm going to think of it as a novel. It's going to tell its own story that's not related to the story that I told in that script. And, and that was the deepest, darkest ditch. <laughs> that I, and it was bad. It was deep and dark. And I, I remember taking a walk and I yell at one day around the neighborhood and just you know, basically looking for her permission to quit, to abandon it. And like, is this, because I'm in despair and I hate this, and it's, I wasted two and a half years on it, and, you know, what if I did something else? And um, she wouldn't let me, because she said, I love these characters so much. I love Archie, I love Gwen, I love uh, the 
world that you're creating here, and I want to read this book, and you have to finish it. Um, so I did. And, and in a way, what got me out of the ditch, what saved me was discovering the importance of the voice of Julie Jaffe, who we, we just see his nipples in this chapter, basically, but and Titus, and their relationship. And, and that was a big part of that first draft. And I, and, and I want to say Titus was barely there. And I just didn't, it wasn't an important element. And as soon as I let the boys into the story, everything else got realigned. And, and suddenly, I had a, a story on its own that had nothing to do with the DNA from, from the TV series. So. A couple more questions? Yes? I listened to some of your recording of some of that. Oh, um, yeah. Interminable book. Thank you for it. Thank you for my interminable book that came to company. Thank you. I was wondering, when you record your books, do you have the same sort of thought process? Do you think, oh, the Sasquatch should have done this, or this person should have done that? Do you, do you go back and think? Do I notice things I'd like to change? <laughs> yeah, I would have changed a thing. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, inevitably. And, and I have to say, and this is probably instructive for, you know, would be writers uh, or, or <coughs> writers in the audience. Um, almost always, the parts that as I'm reading them aloud, I think, like, I wish I had not used that phrase, or, or, or this is dragging, or. Um, I didn't do enough of this character, or whatever it might be that I'm thinking as I'm reading it with many months intervening. Those tend to be um, passages, sentences, or elements that either my wife or another reader <coughs> or my editor try to get me to cut, <laughs> like change, or or increase, or like I'd like to know more about this, and I was like. That's fine, you have enough about that. <laughs> or, you know, some passage I labored over that I, that, that, you know, that somebody said, you know, it's nicely written, but it's not really doing anything, you should cut it. I'm like, how dare you, this is a <laughs> shining <laughs> beacon. <laughs> it was in the dark of night, and, uh, and then I, now I read it out loud, and I'm like, ah, ooh, I should have cut that. Just like Jennifer Barth my editor told me to do. Uh, so, you know, one thing, it's hard for me to learn that lesson, but one thing I have learned is that um, the longer I spend writing a sentence, the longer I spend working on a paragraph, the more likely it is that I'm going to cut that myself within the next two weeks. Whoa. So, you know, just like usually the most labored over passages are the ones that I cut the soonest. Yeah. One uh, sort of sort of that point. There's a passage in Telegraph Avenue, essentially like from the viewpoint of Parrot. Yes. Yeah. And I just thought that was one of the most brilliant yes. passages, and it's just almost like one long run on. Right. It's one sentence. Yes. Yeah. It's a four thousand word sentence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Speak to that as like something. Was there ever a consideration? Did anyone to try to talk me out of that? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, many years, of including my editor. Bless her heart. Incredible. Uh, I yell it when she first read it. Said no. Cut it out. Put some periods in there. Um, <laughs> a lot of people. Um, and I think you know if you read the reviews uh, when the book came out, we you know a lot of people seem to really enjoy and appreciate it, but there are plenty of people that thought it was show offy or too long or whatever. Um, I had a strong. I knew exactly why I wanted to do that sentence. You mentioned cinematic. I wanted to have a kind of uh, uh, you know a single take, a, a tracking shot like the opening of Touch of Evil. I didn't want to do it just to do it, but because I wanted to try to accomplish what a shot like that does, which is to sort of draw, to encompass the world or the place or whatever it is, to just sort of show you the whole thing. When Scorsese does in Goodfellas, and um, when, they, when we follow Ray Liotta into that through the back of that club, and, and there's nothing like that. That that experience when it's done well is so thrilling, and I, and I felt like this was. That's what I needed to accomplish right then, was to say to the reader, here are all the characters that you've gotten to know. They've all been moving around on the chessboard. 
here's where they all are right at this moment. And you know, um, prose doesn't do simultaneity. It has to be sequential. And uh, that was the best way I could come up with for doing it. Um, I also felt like there was a musical or even a final rationale for it, if you will, because um, on one of these things, you know, if you look at it, it looks like individual tracks. Um, you can see a wider gap between the individual tracks, um, and that shows you where the tracks begin and end, but in fact, it's just one groove that goes, starts at the outside and goes all the way into the beginning, and um, no periods, right? <laughs> so, you know, that felt like another reason for doing it. Um, I also have uh, a thing about parrots. <laughs> and I, there was no parrot in this book until I decided to try to write this sentence. And I had that thought of like swoop, uh, a swooping perspective of the camera swooping and flying. And that, that's a bird to me, bird's eye view, you know, it's kind of a trite idea in a way. And then, it, I mean, I'm slowing this process down, but it was all just instantaneous, you know, that I thought parrot. And I have a parrot in the book, The Final Solution. Um, you know, I, mean, I, I will reveal to you all tonight, don't tell anybody else, but it's actually the same parrot in this book. <laughs> He's just 55 years older. Yeah, the parrot, the African great parrots are very long lived. Um, and, uh, you know, that was, I just, as soon as I thought, oh, I can have my parrot come back in this book, and, and then that solved a problem for me, which I had this character, Mr. Jones. Um, he was an old, lonely old man, and he was a little bit of a puzzle to me, a little bit of an enigma to me, and then I thought, oh, that's his parrot, and he has a parrot, and I, before I wrote this long sentence, I went back, started over again, and went through every scene that had Mr. Jones in it, and put a parrot on his shoulder, or nearby, and that changed every scene for the better. As soon as I gave him a parrot, he <laughs> came alive, the scenes worked better for me, and uh, so it all felt very justified. However, I will say that I, mean, I think I am showing it off, too. <laughs> I don't have a problem with that. <laughs> it's, it's chops. It's you know, jazz musicians show off, baseball players show off, you know, and, and somebody hits a home run and they stand back and watch it fly out of the park. That pisses a lot of people off. Um, you so hear the announcers so. complaining about hot dogs. No, no. I like it. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Richie Allen fan from way back. Um, I've always liked the hot dog style players, and uh, I even like Jose Canseco. <laughs> and, um, you know, I just, you know, everybody doesn't have to like it, and everybody doesn't have to do it, and I'm not going to do it all the time, but every once in a while, language is like that. It just, you get carried away, and, and that can feel good. And I, and I, when I write another writer whose work I'm reading gets carried away in that same way, like a book like Blood Meridian, for example, by Cormac McCarthy, which is criticized for being overwritten and, and purple, blood red in its prose and so on, and I see all that, but when he gets going with the cadences and the sentences, he is drunk, you feel this kind of, um, um, the inebriation um, is taken over, and I love it as a reader. I, I all just, I've read that book so many times just for the language alone. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe one more question. You kind of answered it just by your last comment, but I'm curious as to how you continue to educate yourself as a writer. I mean, obviously, you do. How do I continue to educate myself as a writer? Well, um, I mean, on the one hand, you never learn anything. Uh, and, I, and I keep making the same mistakes over and over again that I've been making since I was in my first writer's workshop. And, and my first writing teacher said, you know, write in scenes, dramatize the action through scenes so that characters are talking to each other and they're observing them in real time. And that's how you tell a story, stories, not by summarizing events. And that's like one of the first lessons you learn. And happens all the time. I'll be writing along and getting increasingly discontented and feeling itchy and uncomfortable and it's not working and I don't know what the matter is and then I'll go back and look and it's been 30 pages since I had a scene. And I've just been summarizing, summarizing, summarizing and I didn't even notice. 
And so that's happening after I've been doing this for almost 30 years now. So in one sense, you know, I don't educate myself. <laughs> so I keep doing the same things over and over again. Either it's helping somebody will notice or helping nobody will notice. Um, but I don't stop reading that. I mean, to reading is the, yeah. reading is the um, only sure way to educate yourself as a writer. And, um, and I still find inspiration. I read Dennis Johnson's last book, Train Dreams, that little beautiful, slender novel to everyone should buy. Can they be for a And um, you know, he, in that 115 pages, he tells an entire story of a man's life from childhood through death through as an, as an old man and, and a sweep of the United States history at the same time and all 115 pages and that was so, it's a beautiful book, I was moved by it but I was also challenged by it, you know, the thing like how does he do that and I read it again as soon as I finished it and then after that I read it, parts of it again just to see like what he was skipping and what he was um, dwelling on and in what order he told things in how did he do it? Um, how do you do a book like that? Um, you know, so I'm still studying in that sense too. But most books don't inspire, you know, don't inspire me to do that. But it's, it's only the rare book like that that, you know, uh, uh, that comes along and just makes me first have that sense of like, I don't know if I could do that. And then think, well, if I tried, like how could I do it? How do you do something like that? Like you have an astounding metaphoric gift. I mean, like a poet. Thank and, you. No, really. And I'm thinking, how do you get that? <laughs> well, I mean, thank you. I mean, you use the word gift, and I think it's just like metaphors are not, I don't think about them at all. They're just, I mean, it's a gift in the sense of it's just there, and I use it, and I don't know where it came from, and I don't know why it's like that, but it's just part of the way my. Brain is wired, and if I if I try to want to describe something, I'll try. I'll first think, well, what's it like? And usually the answer is just like right there for me when I need it. And sometimes there are a little bit, there are too many. And I had the experience many times. I remember when I was publishing short stories in the New Yorker, and my editor was Dan Menneker, who's now at Random House, um, and he would always say, uh, "You have three similes in this sentence." <laughs> And they say, oh, I know that's too many, right? <laughs> and, uh, and he'd say, pick one. Oh. <laughs> like, really? I can't have two? <laughs> one simile. And then he's like, there's another simile two sentences later. And I'd be like, yeah. I'd say, check it out. I'm like, what? I can only have one simile in a paragraph? He's like, yes. I can only have one simile in a paragraph. Um, you know, in a way, I completely understand that. But and I, I think as a general rule, it's a good rule. But sometimes you have to do. You know, I'm not a huge. You're gonna think I'm a huge sports fan, or something. I am a baseball fan. But some people have really strange stances when they stand on the plate. They look really weird. If it's not the way you're supposed to stand. But but if you mess with it, then they stop hitting. So um, you know, I think if someone you sense not just metaphors or similes, but other writers do other things that are quirky and, and, and can be annoying or irritating or as a rule, but in, a, in certain writers you just forgive it or you wouldn't even enjoy it because you can tell it's, they can't help it. Uh, well, thank you all for coming. I really